Hello out there, everybody. I hope you guys are all doing well. Uh, Dane here from Moving to Canada, and we are here today to do our live stream on how to prepare your PR application for CEC. Uh, just a heads up, if you are watching this later on YouTube, you don't have to watch every section. You can use the timestamps right down there in the description to jump ahead to the section that most interests you. If you're watching this live, you got to tune in for the whole thing. Sorry about that. Uh, so, uh, we are here to cover uh, specifically preparing a permanent residency application for the Canadian Experience class of Express Entry. Uh, this is because there was an unprecedented Express Entry draw that took place on February 13th, about two weeks ago, uh, where we had uh, more than 27,000 invitations to apply that were issued. Uh, due to COVID, people have 90 days to prepare their PR applications, which means those 27,000 people people have, uh, nine, have until I think May 13th, May 14th to uh, get their application done and sent in. So we're here to help out with that. And uh, joining me today uh, is a regulated Canadian immigration consultant, Deanne Akers Lanz, uh, tuning in from Ottawa. Deanne is also the co-founder of Canada Abroad, a consultancy based out of Ottawa. Thank you so much for joining me today, Deanne. How are you doing? Good, good. Thanks for, for having me on this today. Yeah, of course. I'm uh, excited to have your expertise involved because, uh, you know, at Moving to Canada, we always cover uh, all of the immigration topics and all of the immigration news. But when it gets down to like the really nitty gritty subject matter, like, you know, what to what does the like what documents need to be included, exactly what information needs to be included. Sometimes we don't actually know uh, the answers to those questions because we're not consultants, we're reporters, we we share the information. But you guys, you regulated Canadian immigration consultants, you do this every day. So you, you can answer these detailed uh, specific questions that people have got. So uh, I'm excited to have you, um, you uh, be able to share that expertise with our viewers today. Um, so... I think we'll start uh, just by going over the topics that we're going to be covering today. Um, so I've just pulled up a slide here. Uh, if you're watching on Facebook, uh, please be aware that you can ask questions. We're going to be taking some questions live, uh, but please wait until we're in the topic uh, that we're uh, discussing to ask your question. If you ask a question about like police certificates and we're not talking about police certificates, I'm probably not going to ask it out loud. Uh, you got to wait till we get to the right topic. Um, and uh, furthermore, if you have questions that are not about the PR application for Canadian Experience class, unfortunately, this isn't the event for you. We've got tons of information on the Moving to Canada website, so you can check uh, it out there. We can probably give you some guides there. Um, so for today, we're covering seven topics. As you'll see here, we're starting off with the personal information required for your CEC application. We're going to discuss what to do if that information changes. Uh, then we're going to move into documents that are required, which is a huge topic. Um, and within that, we're going to cover what to do if you can't get a required document. Then and Deanne is going to share her uh, uh, best anecdotes about most common mistakes made by express entry applicants. Um, and we will end off with a section on uh, special COVID-19 immigration measures because there are still those special measures in place and uh, the benefits of working with an immigration consultant. And just before we dive into the uh, the topics. Uh, I do want to take a second to talk about um, the benefits of working with an immigration consultant. So Deanne, you are a regulated Canadian immigration consultant. You prepare applications like this all the time. Um, my understanding is that they're very strict with these PR applications, like stricter than some people may think. Like, what does it take to get yourself refused or rejected with one of these applications? Yeah, so they are incredibly strict um, since basically they implemented express entry because they're trying to do them as quickly as possible. If you're missing anything or the document submitted is not exactly how they've requested it or it's missing any information, they are just going to reject it as incomplete and then tell you to go back into the express entry system and start all over again. So it's not like they're kind and say, well, we see that this document was missing X, Y, Z. Can you upload a new one for us? They're just going to refuse it. And especially with this draw, it's so important for everyone to get it right because, I mean, for a score of 75 or above, we don't know when that's ever going to be picked again. So they're they're not very lenient, unfortunately. 
Yeah, exactly. And so here, like, if you've watched any of the Moving to Canada videos before, if you've been on our website, you know that we're very pro doing the immigration process on your own. There's a lot that you can do just by researching, by, you know, reading forums, like participating in videos like this. Um, but when it comes to the PR application, as you said, Deanne, they're so strict. A tiny little mistake, missing piece of information, missing document, they'll refuse that. They won't give you a chance to address it in the vast majority of cases. So this is one of the situations where it really makes sense to work with a consultant uh, in some degree or another. Uh, we have, uh, I, I know one of the services that you offer, Deanne, is a PR application review. So like when somebody's ready to submit their express entry PR application, uh, they can contact you and you'll, you'll go through all the information and all the documents and check to make sure uh, nothing is missing or incorrect. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. Because we also encourage people, you know, it's an expensive process that, you know, do it on your own as best you can. And if you really have questions or you're not confident, you know, we do that review where we go through all of the application forms, all of the supporting documents and let you know if anything is missing, incomplete, or you want to update it or make changes. Just so you know before submitting that it's been checked over again. Um, you know, so you just feel a bit more confident when it's submitted. Yeah, and I've just pulled up uh, for our viewers, they can see the Express Entry Application Review option on the Canada Abroad website, um, and I will pop a quick little link to that uh, there in the comments section uh, so people can access that. But be aware, I've also pinned... Uh, Deanne's services, uh, Canada Abroad offers consultations. So if you have like specific questions about a specific document, start with that consultation right there in the pinned comment. Um, but I've also uh, popped a link in there for the PR application review. So uh, enough on that. We are. I hope that we've communicated the high stakes nature of uh, <laughs> of this uh, PR application for people. Uh, but let's jump into the topics at hand. So what we're starting with today is the personal information. Um, so once you receive your invitation to apply, so if you were, are one of those people who received one of those 27,000 <laughs> invitations on February 13th, every time I say it, it still shocks me. Um, <laughs> Uh, IRCC in your online account, they're automatically going to uh, like generate a bunch of information that they'll request from you. Um, so this includes uh, bio data about uh, all the people included in the application. Is that right, Deanne? Yeah. So for everyone you've listed, um, and this is probably where a lot of people might have this question is when you created your express entry profile, it did ask you if you had a spouse, but it didn't ask about children. So now on this application, you are going to include your spouse or common law partner and your children. So for bio data for each applicant, it's going to be, you know, name, date of birth, their own marital status, passport details, um, if they've ever applied to immigration before height, eye color. So all of those very basic details, nothing too crazy here. You should have all of that available for you and your family members. Great. Um, and yeah, so I also included here family information is another thing that they're going to be requesting. Um, and that's for, they'll request family information beyond just the accompanying family members. Is that right? Exactly. So with family information, they're actually going to ask you to list the details. Now it's going to be for your parents. Um, if you have step parents, you need to include them as well. Siblings, step siblings, half siblings, uh, your own children and stepchildren. So even if those people are not going with you, they still need to get those details from you. And what they're going to be asking for is their name, their date of birth, the country they were born in, and then just their current location. So just city and country. So you don't have to have their exact house address or anything like that. Okay, great. Um, and that leads into uh, the next sections, which is a bunch of histories. Uh, yes. They're going to ask about, I've got four things listed here, address history, employment history, personal history, travel history. Um, can you tell our viewers a little bit about um, each of those uh, requests? Yes. So the first thing will be the address history. So they're going to ask you for all of the addresses that you've lived in for the past 10 years or since the age of 18, whichever one is more recent. So if you're 22 as an example, then you're just giving four years of address history. So they don't want any gaps. So you have to make sure that you're filling in every month is accounted for every year. And with these address histories, they are gonna use that 
to basically load which police clearances you're going to need. So it's very important that you're as accurate as possible. Some people, you know, they say, I can't remember the exact house number. Just be as close as possible. If you, you know, say house five and it was house six, you know, that's an honest mistake, but just make sure you're being as detailed as you can with this. Right. Um, and uh, the travel history component, they're going to be asking, uh, like, I know a question that I've seen come through a lot is like, how mm. much of my travel history do I like have to include? You know, I've, I've been traveling extensively over the past 10 years yeah. so I have to include everything that I've I've done and if so like how do I even figure that out um any advice for people in that situation yeah so this one as well they're going to ask for all of your travel history either since the age of 18 or the last 10 years whichever is the most recent for you now you don't have to enter any trips to your country of origin so like your country of citizenship or your current country of residence so you don't have to you know add those in right but again, you need to be as detailed as you can. So a good thing is if you happen to have your old passport lying around or your new passport is you have to go through the stamps and try to decipher the dates. But again, be as um, detailed as you can. Some people, they say they're going to be off by a week or so. That's fine. Because again, with this, they're also going to use this to check were you there for six months or longer? Do we need a police clearance? Right. So just be as detailed as you can. If you don't remember, try to go through your passport stamps. Um, if you still have emails or you can log into your if it was Orbitz or Expedia account to see what dates you had booked your tickets for, mm -hmm. try to use those resources to just get as much information as you can. Um, that's, uh, I think very useful for people to know because it's a stressful question to, to answer sometimes, but, uh, I, I've got just hopping back a little bit, a question that came in from Billy who asked, uh, this is about, uh, including family members on the application. Mm. Billy okay. asked, would I include my Canadian born child, uh, on my application? She has dual citizenship. So you don't because they're already a Canadian citizen. Okay. So you can, in your letter of explanation, say that you have that additional child, but they are actually a Canadian, so they're not applying for permanent residence with you. Great. Um, and uh, we've got a, a few questions coming through here um, that uh, are we're going to be addressing in uh a few of our topics ahead. So Esser, I saw Dan Sherry was asking about the COVID restrictions. We are going to get to those questions, but again, everybody remember, uh, try to save your, your questions for the appropriate um, moment uh, in the live stream. Uh, and we've also got a lot of bots in here posting some fake links. So I'm trying <laughs> to keep up with the questions coming in. Um, okay, great. And then the uh, last thing that we wanted to talk about in the personal information is the mandatory questions that mm. um, IRCC asks and you and I chatted about this a couple days ago but uh, we they ask a bunch of like mandatory questions but the two that we wanted to address here are related to immigration and criminal history so can you walk our viewers through those yeah so there is going to be a list I think it's around 10 mandatory questions that they're going to ask you in your personal information history and it's very much related to you know have you ever been arrested before have you ever been detained before or convicted? So it's not just maybe something that's going to show up on your police clearance, but it's also, you know, have you ever been just arrested and detained? And if you were let go, you'd still want to say yes and just put in the details of what happened because Canada does do information sharing with certain countries. So they might have, you know, access to your arrest. It doesn't mean you are convicted and you're inadmissible, but you still want to be transparent. You don't want to hold anything back. You just want to put it down and explain it. Because if you weren't actually convicted, you're just arrested and let go, it doesn't make you inadmissible, but you still have to answer the question truthfully. So there's actually a few and they kind of just seem to reword it. So just make sure you're reading each question in detail because some will say convicted, next question might say arrested. So you just want to make sure that you're answering it truthfully. Yeah, and we're going to talk about that on our, our next slide as well. But the importance of, you know, just be honest on this application. <laughs> Don't try to like, hide things or mislead IRCC uh, because that can really have some lasting implications on your ability to immigrate to Canada. Uh, just before we do move on, um, we had a question come in. Again, I'm going to jump back to the travel history section uh, from Aisling. 
Um, and I remember seeing this question when I would work, uh, I used to work at a law firm preparing some of these uh, applications. So Aisling's asking, uh, this is probably a silly question. No, it's not. Uh, but in the travel history, do you put your flight to Canada when you first moved over as an ongoing trip? And Deanne, I'm going to add to that. Like, I remember people would ask me, like, at what point does a trip become like a change in residence? Like, at what point is it not in my travel history and it should be in my address history? Yeah, so if you, you know, were going to Canada and you're still there, because country of residence is that you're still there. So even if you had entered Canada less than six months ago and you're picked through this program, it's still currently your country of residence. So you don't actually have to include that trip. So that's why, you know, that question is quite relevant. So if you entered Canada and you're still in Canada when you're doing this application, then you don't have to list that first flight because Canada is now your country of residence and you don't have to list any trips to your country of residence. Great. Um, and another good question about uh, employment history in from Molly. Molly is asking, uh, with employment history, do you need to put every single job that you've done? Like, let's say you've done, she said, a day's work in a bar. Um, or <laughs> I know we, we have questions come in from people uh, frequently saying, like, I did this job, but it's a, an NOC skill level C. Mm, uh, okay. And I did this for like a year. So I know that it doesn't contribute to my CRS score or my eligibility. Do I still need to include it? Okay, so this is a great question because when you created your express entry profile, you know, there obviously was the employment section and they're asking about employment that is going to be used to calculate points for the comprehensive ranking system. But now with the permanent residence application, if you didn't put all of your employment, you know, NOC, C level occupations or something you worked for a day, that's fine because now what is there is called the personal history section. So anything that you had not listed in the employment section, you can list it in the personal history because with the personal history section, they have to see that everything is accounted for either in the last 10 years or since the age of 18. So any of those, you know, low skill jobs that you had, you would put them into account for that 10 year period. Right. And basically like if you put a job in the employment history section, they're then going to ask you for documents. Is yes. that correct? So correct. Y you should be aware that you're going to need to get those documents, but you also need to ensure that you're meeting the minimum requirements. So like Always. If, if you yes. take out all of your jobs and put them all in the personal history and then you and they're going to have no work experience and they're going to give you zero points for that. So yeah. In so. any employment you just put in the personal history, they're not going to ask for those letters. So, you know, if it was an NOC C level and you put it in personal history, they're not going to go and ask you for those employment documents. Right. Um, and Kaushik here is asking, does the employment history need to be for 10 years or for the entire period? Um, and as you just said, Deanne, uh, you need to provide a personal history for the past 10 years or since the uh, age of 18. Um and so it depends on, you, you know, th that your age. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it does. You do need to provide that personal history, whether or not you're claiming points for all employment for that entire 10 years. That depends on your own personal situation. Right. Because also in there. So if it's not your study or your education, just so you know, they are going to ask for things like military history or if you did government positions or any organization. So you're going to put those in the personal history section as well. Great. Um, and another question from Yashwant about the personal history section, uh, if we select unemployed, mm -hmm. like how do we describe what the person was doing during this period, um, how to provide the name of the company employer appropriate facility if we're unemployed, like just came out of college looking for a job, that sort of thing. Yeah. So, um, for the employer, just put not applicable. And then for the activity of what you were doing, you could either say unemployed or, you know, job seeking, whichever one was maybe applicable to you. And then the city and the country, you'll know where you were. But for employer, you can just put not applicable because you wouldn't have one. Great. Guys, I just want to take a second and pause here and say, like, do you see how easily Deanne is answering these questions? Like, I don't know the answers to some of these questions. You're probably stressing, you, the audience, are probably stressing out about the answers to some of these questions. If you've got more of these questions afterwards, book the consultation with Deanne. Like, she, she, she's going to be able to give you peace of mind on, on your PR application. It's really worth your time. Um, okay. Who? Uh, so people are asking, okay, I think a lot of these questions are about uh, the documents. Um, so mm. we'll get to that later. Um, okay, so I'm going to move on to the next uh, slide here. 
think it's time. Um, and this will address some of the questions too. So what do you do if your information changes? Um, mm -hmm. And we had someone who just asked this question. I'm going to find your name so I can shout you out. Carmen, what to do if my information in the employment section changes? So mm -hmm. what to do depends on um, where you're at in the application process. So uh, if you have received your invitation to apply, um, but you haven't yet submitted the PR application, so if you're one of these CEC candidates, this is probably where you're at right now, um, you may, like, maybe your circumstances will change, or maybe you'll realize you made a mistake uh, when you created your profile. Mm -hmm. So you can still make changes to your information, but uh, there are three things to be aware of here. Uh, the first, and yet I'm going to ask you to expand on this, is the requirement to meet the minimum eligibility criteria. What does that mean? So um, specifically for the CEC applicants right now, you're picked because you showed that you had one year of full-time equivalent paid work experience in Canada in the last three years, or full-time equivalent. And that work experience was at an NOC O, A, or B level. So when you finally submit this application, the first thing the officer is going to verify is, with your work experience, do you still have that one year of Canadian experience in a qualifying occupation? And does it now still fall within the last three years? And I note this because we have seen some people that when they got the ITA, it was within the three years, but by the time they submitted the permanent residency, it now had fallen outside of it and they had just under a year, so they were no longer eligible. Right. So if it is sort of borderline for you, you might end up having to submit your application much sooner than those 90 days because you always want to make sure that you've got that one year that falls within the three years as of the day you submit the application, not the day of your ITA. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, so we've got a question came in from Anna uh, or possibly Anna and they say can you update any work titles after you're invited so I'm going to try to expand on what you uh, just said Deanne so what you're saying is like if Anna's work titles changed after they were invited um, they would be able to update that and change that as long as it didn't affect uh, you know the maybe the skill level of, of mm. their occupation so like if if you put it in your profile that you were like a supervisor at a retail store but then you realized <laughs> afterwards that you were actually only a cashier uh if you change that and it dropped you down to noc skill level c that could cause a problem but if you just had the wrong title in there initially and it's still a skilled occupation that would be okay exactly so some people we see that they put in their job title and then their employer you know it's slightly different but as long as you are still at the same noc code or the same level then you're fine but like dane like you said if you thought you were a supervisor but then your employer writes a letter saying you're a cashier unfortunately then you're going to drop below um, the NOC level required and you're not going to be eligible anymore. So those are the things to look out. But yeah, it's very frequent that we see the job titles don't match what's on the letter. So you can change those. That's not a problem at all as long as the skill level is the same. Great. Um, and the next uh, requirement here, if you want to change your information, you know, after you receive your invitation, but for, before you submit your PR application, is the requirement to meet the CRS score. Uh requirements. So can you yeah. tell our viewers what that means? Right. So what happens is the day you received your invitation to apply on there, it said the score you had as of the day you received it. So when you're ready to submit the permanent residency application, you want to go through and check if your CRS score has changed or not. And they've actually added a great new function within your portal. Once you've done all of your on app, sorry, your online application forms, you can actually hit calculate my score and it'll recalculate it for you and say what it is. So then you can actually double check, has it gone down? Um, but luckily with this draw, I mean, if it goes down a little bit, it's a, it's a great time because unless you go below 75, you can still proceed with your application. Right. Um, it's important because some people might have thought they had two full years of Canadian experience, mm -hmm. but when they get their letters, maybe they're just shy, so they're only getting points now for one year. When you recalculate your score, your score will go down. But for this specific draw, um, as long as it's above 75, that's fine. So always just recalculate your score and then compare it to the score required on the day you received your ITA. Great. Um, yeah. And again, 
you guys, this is one of the reasons why uh, this is a high stakes uh, application for those of you who, you know, have a score lower than, let's say, like 450, 440. You know, we haven't seen a lot of draws below that level. So um, you have a bit of flexibility as far as, you know, the, the CRS score requirement is yeah. concerned. But it's really important that first uh, line here, the requirement to meet the minimum eligibility criteria, that's the one that you've really got to verify if you are changing information for this uh, for this round specifically. Um, now, the last thing that we have in here is the possibility of misrepresentation. Um, so my understanding of this um, is that if you lie on a, uh, a Canadian immigration application or if you knowingly and willingly mislead uh, an immigration official, they can charge you criminally. Is that accurate? Yeah, I mean... The likelihood of them charging you criminally is very unlikely. So usually what they're going to do is they're going to find you guilty of misrepresentation. And then you're actually banned from Canada for five years. So if you're in Canada right now, then that might lead to um, you being removed from Canada. So you want to make sure that whatever you're putting on your application, you're as honest and truthful as possible. Some people leave things off because they think it's inconvenient. But I mean, if it's something you can just do with a letter of explanation, you know, don't risk getting a misrepresentation filed against you because five years, it's a very long time. Right. Um, and for especially CEC candidates, I mean, Canada might be your home already right now. You don't want to jeopardize that and get sent uh, back to, you know, a country you haven't been living in for a while. So just don't risk it. Everything needs to be truthful. Don't remove things now that... You're just afraid you can't get a document for, rather do a letter of explanation later. Um, so just always, always be truthful and accurate. Great. Um, and uh, uh, we've got a couple of questions coming here. Let's uh, let's see if we can help a couple of people out. Uh, Enrica uh, asks, um, for accompanying spouses working currently on NOCC positions, should we include it in the employment history or the personal history? It doesn't claim any points. I'm going to try to use the information that you told us earlier, Deanne. So if they're not claiming any points for it, and if it doesn't help them uh, meet the minimum uh, eligibility requirements for the program, they can include that in the personal history, and then it won't require them to submit uh, documentary evidence. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. Okay, great. Look at us. We're learning. This is like a fun family learning experience. Um, I am having a good time. So <laughs> hopefully s at least one viewer is also having a good time as well. Um, okay. I'm just seeing if there's any other good questions in mm. here. Um, there's some questions about documents. Oh, so here's one that is about documents, but also kind of about what to do if something changes. So let's address it now. Michelle asks, what happens if my English test expires before my application is submitted? Great question. What happens? Yeah. Ian? Okay, so when you submit your application, you have to have a valid English test. So if your test has now expired, go out immediately and get a new test because you're going to have to put your new test results on that application before you submit. Because the requirement is your language test has to be valid at the time of submission. So we have seen this. If that one is now expired, you have to have a valid one at the time you submit. So you can go out, redo it. Just make sure that with that new language test, you still have enough points that you would have received the invitation to apply and fill in the details of the new test. So always make sure that your language test is valid at the time you submit the application. Yeah. And you said make sure that you still meet the points required. Um, that's both for the CRS score. You have to figure out the CRS score calculation and also the points required for the CEC minimum uh, eligibility criteria as well, which exactly, varies yeah. depending on your occupation skills. And it's good, yeah. Um, great. So we're going to move on to, it's it's now, uh, we're half an hour in. So I want to get to the document. Oh, section. Oh, but we have after, what happens if your information changes after you submit your PR application? This one is pretty yeah. easy to address. Uh, the first thing that you need to know, everybody, if you're submitting your PR application is Almost all of the time, you cannot update your information after you submit it. You ha like you have to have all of the documents and all of the requirements when you hit submit because they're not going to let you go back in and change information later on. Um, yeah. They're just going to refuse your application <laughs> instead. Uh, that being said, there are certain instances, a few types of information um, that you have to update if it changes after you submitted your application. Um, Deanne, can you give a couple examples of, of that type of information? 
Yeah. So after you submitted, uh, you might get married or you might um, be common law only after the submission, or maybe you're having a new baby. So anytime there's a family change, you're going to want to update the government with that. And uh, you're also going to want to obviously add your family member to your permanent residence application. So you can definitely do that um, because a a question we see all the time is sort of if you are getting married after the submission, can you include your spouse? And absolutely you can. Um, You don't want to hide that marriage because that's misrepresentation again at the end of the day. So you want to let them know of any um, family composition changes. Um, I always say, obviously, too, if you've changed locations, so if you are no longer in Canada or maybe you're outside of Canada and now you're in Canada, let them know about your address because also later, and we'll talk about this, when you're going to get your confirmation of permanent residency issued to you, depending on your location, the process is a bit different. So always also let them know where you're living. Right. Uh, and that's fine to change. <laughs> Great. And um, we've got some people asking, like, if information changes, like, should should we let them know why we changed our information and maybe use an LOE? People are referring to this letter of explanation. Mm. Um, and we are going to talk about that in reference to the document requirements. So I'm going to ask those of you who are asking about the LOE, uh, just hang tight. We're going to get to that in a few minutes, but I'm going to use that as a brilliant segue. What brilliant hosting this is. Um <laughs> to move into our next section which is the required documents and we've split this up into two sections the required documents Mm -hmm. are everybody and then some of the common required documents that not everyone will need to provide but that you should that you may need to provide depending on your situation um so you'll see we've added a disclaimer right at the top of this section saying always refer to your personalized document checklist to know what you need to include in your application uh deanne and i have have not seen your (laughs) express entry profiles we don't know what's asked of you uh you've got to make sure that you're providing the information that ircc is requesting um that being said there are some standard documents that everyone is going to have to provide passports um i know we see a lot of the time people asking like what pages of my passport do i have to include Mm -hmm. Um, can you tell people uh, the answer to that question, Deanne? Yeah. So the first one is what they call your bio data page. So that's the one that has your photo and your name and your date of birth on it. But they also, in addition to that, they want you to upload um, scans of any pages in your passport that have visas or stamps on them. So you don't necessarily have to scan your entire passport. It's just the bio data page and then any pages that have the stamps or the visas on them. And that's for the current valid passport that you've put on your application. Sweet. And is that for all of like yourself and accompanying family members? Right. So for you, your spouse, if applicable, and then your dependent children that are on there as well. Great. Um, The second document here is your language test results. Um, I think I can maybe do this one. So so most like you will have had to already submit uh, results from your language test, but now you're going to have to upload the actual like uh, test that you took. Is that correct? Yeah. But the interesting thing here is there's no spot to upload it. So it's not actually requested of you. So, yeah. So a lot of people, that's the question we get is where do I put my owls? Where do I put my self pip? So they don't actually ask you to upload this because when you enter the details, um, on your profile, they ask for all the details because they can go into the system and check your results. So don't be worried. There is no spot to actually upload your language test, but we always suggest, upload it. Um, There's a client information section, which we'll kind of go over in a bit with the the letter of explanation. But I always upload those results as a backup in case you've typed in anything incorrectly in the test report number. But there's no official spot. So it's going to kind of get uploaded as an extra document with your letter of explanation, typically. Great. And you do advise, even though it's not required to upload that uh language yeah. test result would that be you know in the in the event that you accidentally i know there's with ielts at least there used to be this really complicated number. <laughs> number with like letters and numbers and stuff is that like if you make a mistake with that number that way they have a backup version that they can see exactly because they will take that long number input it on the system and bring up your results and if they can't find it then they're going to request it from you anyway so we always like to include it just so there's no back and forth with the officer um, you know that you have to upload documents later so I always suggest upload it with the letter of explanation sweet okay that's cool Um, the next thing we have listed here is the medical exam confirmation Uh, what is that document Yeah, so part of the process is um, every family member needs to go for a medical exam, and these are with a panel physician, so you can't just necessarily go to your local doctor. You have to make sure that they're approved by immigration, and when you go for that appointment, they're going to 
give each family member. It's just, it's got your photo and the date of your visit and just confirming that you went for your medical. You will take that, scan it and upload it to your application. And then that just proves that you managed to do your medical before submission. But this is one of the documents that they are giving leeway with, with COVID. So if you can't manage to see that panel physician before your submission date, then in place of this, you would just put a letter of explanation to say, you know, my exam is only on X and X date. I will give you the results once I have them. Great. Um, And that's a, we had a question come in earlier uh, saying like, I've heard that they're not refusing applications because of COVID. We're going to talk about this in a bit more detail Mm. later on, but like um, they are (laughs) refusing, they are still refusing applications uh, except with certain documents. Uh, As Deanne mentioned, the medical exam is one of them where if you can't book it because of, you know, COVID uh, restrictions in your area, you can upload a document in its place you always have to upload a document in its place yes <laughs> um, and they'll give you a bit more time but you can't necessarily do that with everything so just right. we're going to talk about that more later on just be aware of that um so we're going to move on now to the um police certificate section and we always get a ton of questions <laughs> about police certificates uh we had a good question come in in the facebook discussion beforehand uh, but it's a bit of an edge case so um deanne can you tell people what is the police certificate um and like where in what instances do you need to get it like for which countries that you've lived in anywhere you've ever been okay yeah so and this is fun because they have changed it so many times over the last few years so you know, um, on that note, always check before submission, but as of today, you need a police clearance for any country that you spent six months consecutively or longer in, either in the last 10 years or since the age of 18. So again, whichever one is more recent. Uh, So your current country of residence, if it's Canada, you don't need to get a police clearance for Canada, okay? If they want to, they can request one later from you, but they specifically note if you're in Canada, it's your current country of residence, you don't have to worry about that. But any other country that you've lived in for six months or longer, you need to get a police clearance from that country, okay? Um, The other thing they note, because some people might say, I'm from Australia and I went back for a holiday. Do I need to get a police clearance because I went back there? Only if you had gone back there for six months or longer would you need to get a new police clearance? So it gets a little bit confusing here, I guess, when we say this, but if you had a police clearance issued from Australia and the date on that police clearance, you haven't lived there for six months or longer since then, then you can use it. You don't have to get a new one just because you went back there for two weeks. Okay, great. Um, it's <laughs> This is <laughs> one of the places where it starts to get a little complicated. And yeah. I'm also gonna warn people out there, the police certificates are one of those documents that's like so strict. If you're supposed to submit four police certificates and you only submit three, or you submit the fourth, but it's like the wrong document for the country that you're coming from, which yeah. happens. I, I th- I've like heard people, for some reason, Australia comes to mind. <laughs> like, Big uh, time with Australia. Yeah, yeah they, people end up getting the wrong document. Like they're just they're gonna refuse your application. Like there's there's just no question about it. Um, so uh, always be sure about that. Um, we've got a guide on the Moving to Canada website that goes over this in more detail. I just posted mm-hmm. a link to it, but I'll just show you guys the web page here. So you can click that link if you want to read um, about the police certificate requirements. Um, and again, there's always going to be like edge cases and questions about this. Um, that's again, why we recommend, you know, book a consultation with a consultant or, uh, you know, have a, consul- a consultant review your final permanent residency application to catch mistakes like the ones that can happen here. Um we had, speaking of edge cases, a question come in. I'm going to go back to that question from our, our viewer beforehand, Luca, who asked, this is a good question. Do I have to submit a police certificate if I've been living in a new country for five months at the time of submitting the application? Deanne, I know you said you need it if you've been living for six consecutive months. Um, but what about five months? So five months, um, not technically. You haven't been there long enough yet. But on that note, if you're at five months, the officer has every right to request it of you. So you might find it wasn't required when you submitted your application. And now the officer has sent you a message saying, I want your police clearance from this country. It's not a mistake. They have the right to ask for a police clearance from any country they want. Uh, We've even seen it where somebody just made a two week trip to a country 
And later the officer did ask for a police clearance from that country. Um, there might be a, a logic behind it. Maybe they know you have a record there that you you know you were trying to to hide. What did um, you do in the Maldives when you were 22? <laughs> exactly. So just be aware, um, unless it was six months, it's not required, but they have every right and they may request it because it's so close and they know that you're continuing to live there. So just be aware. And sometimes if it is a case that you know it's a country that takes extremely long to get a police clearance, you might want to apply for it just as a backup so that it's not delaying your application later. Great. Um, and there are so there are a bunch of really good questions coming in here. Um, Mary uh, is asking, and uh, Ruth has a similar question. Uh, I got police certificates when I applied for my working holiday visa. Uh, I haven't been back since then. Mm -hmm. Do I have to get the police certificates again and ruth uh similarly said i lived in the states got a police certificate over a year ago but haven't been back since then do i need a new one so it'll depend on the date you left the country and when it was issued so let's say that you were living in the united states for a year so you had been there for over six months you're living there for a year and the police clearance was issued before you left the country well technically you need a new one because they want it to have been issued after you left the country. But then if you now went back for a holiday, you wouldn't have to get a new one. So let me maybe rephrase that. You're there for a year. After you left, the police clearance has to have been issued after that date. Right. Okay. Okay. But then if you had one issued and now you've gone back to the States for a week or two, you don't have to get a new one. You can still use that. So it's, they're clearance. saying the last time you have to get it after the last time that you resided there. Uh, for six consecutive months. So it has to be after you left as a resident. But if you've returned yeah. as like just a visitor, then that's that can just be a, a trip and you don't need a new one necessarily. Ooh, holy yeah. moly. This yeah, is... police clearances are, like I said, probably the, the most common reason for a refusal that we see because it does each country can be a complicated thing that you need to discuss. But um, if you're living there, it needs to have been issued after you left. Um, great. And we've got a question here from Dave saying, my country requests a letter from immigration to mm -hmm. issue a certificate. Will they send me a letter? Um, and I know that I've also seen on the police certificate like website, like sometimes mm -hmm. they say like, you don't need a certificate for, for this country. Like, what are those two kind of edge cases? Right. So for any country you need a police clearance from, I'm sure you guys have it in your guide. Um, IRCC has a link that you can put in whatever country it is, and it will tell you if you need one or not. So some countries, like war-torn countries specifically, it might say you do not need one from this country at all because they just know it's too difficult to get. So if that is the case, in place of that police clearance, you would just upload a letter saying, you guys have specifically said, I don't need one from this country. And you can even include a screenshot you know, from the site and upload it. If it's one of the countries that they say specifically you're going to need a request letter, then what you're going to do is same thing. You'll upload a letter saying my country requires a letter from you guys for me to get it. And then after you've submitted your full permanent residence application, that letter will be sent to you through your online account. So you'll get a notification that there's a message, you'll download it, and then it's that letter that you can send off with your police clearance request. Immigration. <laughs> <laughs> what's happening this is so complicated yeah sorry if i'm making anyone more confused out there like but... it all makes sense i'm just like shocked by a how complex it is but b how like just casually without even like a breath you're like this is exactly the answer <laughs> it's like great um everybody click that link in the pinned comment book a consultation with dm <laughs> pay this woman for her work um <laughs> great so um a bunch of other questions. You know what? I'm mm. going to move on to the next uh, topic here because we are going to run out of time. Um, the next topic is the other big document mm. that's like very complex. Um, and this is the proof of work experience. Um, so they ask for work reference letters. Um, before we get into it again, we've got a great guide on this um, on the Moving to Canada website. You can see it. Uh, I've just pulled it up here and I'll pop a link to that uh, as well in the comment section here. Um, so it, it, it's quite complicated. This guide gives you some mm -hmm. ideas of, you know, what is actually required as well as like some alternative documentation, which is always a little 
you know, it's always accepted at the discretion of the officer handling your yeah. file. Um, but we sometimes it's just impossible to get what's required and you have to submit something different. Um, so Deanne, can you tell people what uh, what is the work reference letter requirement? Uh, what do you have to submit? Yeah, so for any of the um, employment periods for which you're going to be claiming points on your CRS score, you have to upload proof of that employment. So this is going to be a letter from the employer. It needs to be on company letterhead. It needs to provide the dates that you work there, so start date to end date or start date to current. It needs to have your job title. It would need to confirm how many hours per week you were working. It would need to confirm that you were paid. So some countries are happy to, or sort of companies are happy to put your exact um, hourly wage or your salary, but if they don't want to disclose it, they could just say you were paid. And then the most important thing is it has to list your roles and responsibilities. So what did you do in that job? If you are submitting a letter and it just has your title, but no roles and responsibilities, they will refuse it. They need to know what you are responsible for doing on a daily basis because that's how they're going to confirm the NOC code that you listed is actually what you did. Mm -hmm. And then these letters just have to also be signed either by your manager or human resources. Great. Um, and that's that's really important, the, the NOC requirement for uh, Canadian experience class. Well, actually for all of Express Entry, it always has to be uh, you have to have enough skilled work experience to meet the minimum eligibility criteria. Um, and yeah. skilled work experience, uh, as a refresher, are occupations at NOC skill level 0A or B. Um, and when they're l trying to figure out what occupation uh, you have, uh, the, the, the title, your job title is, you know, it's, it's kind of important. But the, the big thing that they're looking at is the duties and responsibilities. Um, and they're going to look at like the top duties and responsibilities of the NOC code you're claiming. And they're going to compare it to the duties and responsibilities in your uh, reference letter. Um, yeah. So that's, that's something that you really want to pay attention to. Um, and uh, like, if the uh, if, if like Deanne, what would happen if if somebody's work experience like if it doesn't line up exactly like um, if it's maybe like between NOC codes that they're concerned that it, it like that it doesn't exactly line up with their occupation? Yeah, and this is incredibly common because you know an NOC code can encompass a few hundred job titles, so it's not always going to be perfect for you. But if you find that maybe there's two or three NOC codes that could potentially be the one for you, you want to pick the one that's most correct. So it's never, it's very rare we see that it's 100%, I do every duty that's listed with this NOC code, but you want to say that it's at least 51%. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I've heard of people in the past asking, like, should I just copy and paste the list of like duties from the NOC website and have my employer put that in? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> we we uh, we see them come back with that as well. They want a new letter from the employer in their own words. So if the employer is not sure, like I don't know what this means, you can say, well, this is what the government considers the main duties. As a guide, do not copy and paste that. Um, they want to see that the employer has put it in their own words. So sometimes the easiest thing for the employer is to take, you know, your job description, what you were given uh, when you were offered the job, and put that in the letter because then it's kind of already pre-written for them. But do not copy and paste directly from the NOC website. Great. Um, I, I think that's a good thing for people to know because it seems like yeah. the easiest way to do it. But, um, you know, some... Uh, sometimes the easy way is not the right way. Um, exactly. <laughs> so uh, people uh, frequently ask, like, are there other documents? Like, it seems like I should have to upload, like, pay stubs. And, um, like, Dave is asking, what should I upload in, in that section? Um, mm -hmm. Do I have to upload, like, pay stubs, my tax forms, my, like, anything else related to my employment? It's not mandatory. The only mandatory document is that letter. Um, I always say if you have your T4 or you have a pay slip or you have a contract, they do encourage you to upload it with the letter. But because some people then will ask, well, I've got a contract and I got a T4, but I don't have the letter, so I'm fine. No, no, no. Letter is essential, mandatory. But then if you do have the contract, a few pay slips, T4, definitely put it with the letter. It's definitely useful because they can verify that it's, you know, it's legitimate because sometimes if they have a concern with the letter, that's where they're going to go steps further and want more documents to verify the period of employment. So if you have it, definitely upload it. Um, but always 
every document you upload has to be under four megabytes. Um, so you might have to compress it or be selective with what you're adding to that letter. You might not be able to upload 200 pages. Yeah, but you can include supplementary information. And if you help Absolutely. it, if you think it helps make your case, like, yeah, go for it. And that also brings us to like the situation where you might not be able to get the, the exact letter that they request, in mm -hmm. which case, um, you know, are there alternative documents that people can submit and like is there a risk associated with that yeah so okay because again the officer's discretion on what they're going to accept but let's say that you can't get the letter in the exact format it's missing your roles and responsibilities and i mentioned that because it's the most common thing that we see the employers for whatever reason their hr department says yeah we'll give you um, a record of employment that just says you worked here from this date to this date and this was your job title and that's it like it won't confirm that you were paid or your hours yeah and so carmen just kind of... literally just asked what if the employer yeah. gave me a letter with no duties explained <laughs> like, okay but i have them apart so, from my employment documents perfect so depending on what it is you'll have that first the letter that they gave you and then if it is your duties that aren't there some people um an example is when you got your contract and you started working for them, your job description might have actually been in that contract. So then you can upload the letter that they gave you with the copy of the signed contract you had, because then your roles and responsibilities were in that official company document. Okay. But it can't be your own affidavit. So if they also maybe the first week that you started gave you an intro pack and here was your job description, then you upload that pack with the letter, but you can't do your own affidavit. It needs to be something that the company gave you. So a job description on company letterhead, or like I said, if it was your contract that had it, then you would just put that with the letter. Right. Um, so we've got, uh, again, I'm just going to pull up that uh, guide on our website with some examples of like extra documents that you could submit, um, you know, pay slips, tax forms, records mm -hmm. of employment, letters from former coworkers that are, you know, again, signed affidavits, um, even things that are like bank account statements with uh, pay deposits highlighted, media yep. stories about the company that mentioned your name, or like have your photo. In the, like it, yep. it, this is if you're trying, if you're trying to make up for the letter that you can't get. Um, yeah. But as you said, Deanne, and this is really important, these things are accepted only at the discretion of the immigration officer who's assessing your file um, yeah. what works with for one person might not work for another person um, yeah. and vice versa um, and so people just have to be aware if you ever stray from the exact required documents that IRCC lists there's always a risk because it's always going to be accepted on a discretionary basis um, exactly. And if you're submitting something alternative, you know, if you're not submitting the um, the document exactly as laid out on the IRCC website, that's a time when you should go to a consultant, go to somebody who has done this before, someone like Deanne, who, who knows, you know, what historically has worked and hasn't worked for the most mm. or the least clients. Um, and, and again, click that link right in the pinned comment to book that consultation, because some of you out there are in this exact situation, I know. Um, Sarah, let's see if we've got, uh, oh man, Deanne, we're, the, we're, we're, uh, we've got a lot of stuff to get through here. <laughs> um, so uh, Aline and a few people have been asking this question. We addressed this earlier. If you don't have the documents to, to justify the proof of employment, do you remove it from your employment history and put it in your personal history? You can do that if it doesn't affect your ability to meet the minimum eligibility requirements for the program and the uh, minimum CRS score requirement for the draw within which you were issued your ITA. It is possible, um, but uh, you always have to check those two things if you make any changes to your information. Um, let's rattle through a couple more of these required documents. Um, and again, guys, if you have more questions about work experience, you can see how complicated it is. Book a consultation and Deanne will be happy to help you. Um, so digital photos, uh, that's a requirement for everyone you'll see, uh, in your, in your, um, uh, application. It's, that's probably the most straightforward thing in the whole thing. Um, so let's jump ahead to proof of funds. And we've had a bunch mm. of questions about the proof of funds. Um, my understanding is that it's not required for the Canadian experience class. You don't need proof of funds. So what do you do for this document, Deanne? Yeah. So, um, and just in case people outside of the CEC are listening. So it's just, if you're under the Canadian experience class, so your ITA says you were picked under the Canadian experience class, okay you're actually not required to show a certain amount of settlement funds, but the system is automatically gonna create a spot that says proof of means of financial support. 
So what you're going to upload there, you don't have to get the bank documents. You can just upload a letter that says, I was selected under the Canadian Experience class and I am not required to show proof of some funds. And that's it. Great. Easy. Easy. We've had people asking, like, what do I have to submit for this? That's it's yep. just the quick CDC, letter. CDC, you just do that quick letter and upload it in that spot. Great. Um, and then the next uh, document here is biometrics. And I've added a question there, question mark yes. there. Uh, I'll give a quick rundown on this. Uh, typically, when you submit a PR application, after you after you submit the application, so it's not before you submit, uh, IRCC will come back and say, okay, great. Now, can you go get your, your biometrics? You get your like fingerprints taken and, and, and that. Um, and then you submit that information. Um, there's two things to remember right now. One, um, because of COVID, Canada has introduced a temporary public policy exempting foreign nationals who are submitting PR applications to submit the biometrics if they have submitted biometrics for a different temporary residence application within the last 10 years. Do I have that right? Correct. <laughs> yes. So if you did biometrics before and because Canada hasn't actually required them for more than 10 years, Odds are, if you've done them before, then they were in the last 10 years and you don't have to redo them. Yeah. And since most CEC candidates are in Canada and have recent Canadian work experience, in fact, all of them do, uh, it's likely that you'll be exempted from this requirement. But of course, pay attention to your account. Uh, always pay attention to your IRCC account. Um, now, if you are, if you fall outside of that exemption and it is requested of you, the other thing to be aware of is that the biometrics are another one of those documents that they're being a bit lenient with because of COVID. So let's say you can't book your biometrics appointment because the biometrics centers are closed near you because of COVID. Um, you still have to upload a document. You still have to like upload a letter that says, I can't do this because the center is closed, but I will do this once it's open again. Is that correct? Well, with biometrics, they've actually um, put one of these policies in place. So because it is one of the things that's requested after the fact, if you receive a request letter for biometrics, it will usually say within 30 days, you need to go do it. But they have specifically said for this, they're going to give you automatic 90 day extension. You don't even have to ask for it. So they're basically right. going to keep giving you a 90 day extension until you are able to go for it. So you don't actually have to write in and ask for the extension with biometrics right now with COVID. But again, this could change at any time. So always just go and double check on the day you receive that request if anything has changed. But right now they've specifically said they're going to give you automatic 90 day extensions for this. Great. Um, I, I think that's super useful for people to know, um, yeah. especially, and, but one thing to bear in mind is if you're, especially if you're watching this later, like a year from now, uh, these are special <laughs> COVID measures. They, yeah. they will change. Uh, they will change. It's just a matter. Of, it's not a question of if it's a question of when, um, exactly. so check what's, uh, what's up when you are submitting your application. Um, I'm going to move on to our next topic here. Um, and Deanne, are you okay to go a few minutes? Uh, yeah. Uh, over yeah. Here? Okay. Cause uh, we're, we've, we've filled up our full hour. And we're, we're not all the way through here. Um, We'll try to go through these, uh, this next slide, which is required documents if applicable. Um, so th these may not be required for everybody, uh, but uh, for many of you, some instance of these documents will be required. So the first is uh, the proof of education, um, which interestingly is not necessarily required for all CEC candidates, but uh, can you shine some light on that, Deanne, like who needs to upload their proof of education and what do they upload? Right. So if you listed education on your express entry profile and you received any points for it, um, then you're going to be requested to upload proof of education. And what they want here specifically is actually the copy of the certificate diploma degree that you earned points for. So if you just upload your educational credential assessment with no degree or certificate copy, it's incomplete. It'll be refused. So it's the actual certificate or diploma that they want. But I always include the educational credential assessment report with it. But the essential item is the actual copy of the degree, diploma, or certificate. Yeah, and that's really important because you, if you don't include that diploma, like you said, Deanne, they're, they're not going to give you a chance to upload it later. They're just going to yep. refuse your application. Um, so that's uh, that's great. Remember, it's education is not a minimum eligibility criteria mm -hmm. for the Canadian Experience class, which is why it's not required for everybody. But in many cases, for a 
typical draw, and this one is atypical, yeah. lots of people need the education to meet the minimum CRS score requirement. Um, again, for this one, because it's only 75, it's not as much of an issue, but uh, a lot of the time it is. So um, the next thing here is uh, it, it's related to, um, you know, your relation with your uh, family members. So I'm actually... Uh, going to cover all four of these at the same time, but I have proof of marriage, mm -hmm. proof of common law status, proof of divorce, or proof of like death of a spouse or a former mm -hmm. spouse. Um, so if you are, you know, claiming that you have uh, that one of those types of relationships, you're going to have to submit documentation proving that. Um, we're not going to be able to go into the exact documentation for each of these. Uh, it's it's not terribly complicated for you know marriage, divorce, or death. It's usually just a certificate you have to upload. Yeah. If you're common law, um, <laughs> that is a bit trickier, and you may want to read up on that uh, before you yeah. uh, submit your application and maybe have a consultant look it over. Uh, so it can be a little tricky. Um, mm -hmm. And a part of that as well, Deanne, is the uh, this form, Immigration IMM 5409 Statutory Declaration of Common Law Status. Can you tell our viewers a little bit about the importance of that? Yeah, so if you've listed that you're common law, um, there is a specific government form that you're going to have to print out and complete with your partner. And important to note here is this form also has to be then signed off by a commissioner of oaths. So it's not just that you guys can do it at home and upload it. If it's not stamped and signed off by the appropriate commissioner of oaths, again, incomplete application. So that is the first document they want from you is that form signed and completed as appropriate. And then you would include with that form your supporting documents to verify the common law union. So they need to be satisfied that you've been living together for at least 12 months before your application um, is submitted. Yeah, and that can get very complicated. So just to be, be aware of that, common law folks out there. Um, related to all of this, like uh, your relation to your partner, um, you also have to, uh, if you're claiming children on your application, uh, submit proof of your relationship to your children. Uh, so typically that's uh, birth certificates. Um, is that right? Yeah, so it's specifically, and again, depending which country you're in, it might be called a birth certificate, or some countries it's an unabridged birth certificate. For the children, it has to be the version of the birth certificate that lists both their mom and dad's details. So both of your parents have to be listed on your birth certificate because they want to verify that you're actually immigrating with both of your biological parents. Otherwise, if it's not, then there's additional documents that would be required with that. Great. Um, and... When we were talking before, you brought up like an edge case that I've got in our slides here as well. Like mm. if you're moving, but only one parent of the child is moving, there's a, a special document. Is that right? Yeah. So if it's, you know, a case that the other parent, like maybe it's a divorce or they just, you know, not accompanying the parent who's not accompanying, they need to sign a declaration authorizing their child to move with the other parent. So it's a form, again, a government form that you would have to download, complete, get the non-accompanying parent to sign off. And they also have to provide a certified copy of their own identity document to go with that document. Um, and then a, it's a, sorry, if applicable, also your custody agreement, um, if you have one in place, would also go with that. Okay. So if there is a case that it's one parent taking the child there's going to be certain documents that you're going to have to upload um, that you might want to discuss what's going to be necessary in your case. Right. Okay, great. Um, quick question here from Reese. Uh, what if your common law partner is already a Canadian citizen? Okay, then it's um, not applicable. So it should have asked you, because in your profile, we'll ask you if you're common law or married, and then it should ask you if your spouse is actually a Canadian or not. Um, so if they are Canadian then you won't have to list them on the application and you won't need to actually get those those documents. Yeah, my understanding is that if your partner is a Canadian, your application will be treated as though you are single. Like, yeah, okay, cool. Yeah. Um, so there may have been something that was in, entered incorrectly there, Reese, if they're asking you for all of those documents. Um, yeah. So uh, a few minor documents we're going to rattle through kind of quickly here. Mm. Uh, proof of relative in Canada. Uh, you can claim points for a sibling, uh, up to 15 points. Is that right? Yep. <laughs> My brain is giving out on me now. Uh, yeah. And if you do claim those points, you have to provide proof of your relation. Um, 
if you are using a representative, um, like an immigration lawyer or an immigration consultant, um, you have to submit the use of representative form, IMM 5476. Um, and if you want someone else to be able to uh, you know, access your information, uh, you have to submit the authority to release information form, IMM 5475. Mm -hmm. um, another document here is the job offer letter. Um, this is if you have a valid offer of employment from a Canadian employer. Is that right? Yeah. So if you earned uh, 50 points on your CRS score for a valid job offer. So in some cases, um, people might be in Canada on an employer-specific work permit um, or an intercompany transfer, and they were there for a year. And because they're continuing to work there, they're getting 50 extra points. Okay. If that's the case, um, your letter of reference, like your employment letter, is not good enough. You also have to get a very specific job offer letter mm -hmm. to confirm that they're going to continue to employ you um, for a certain period after your permanent residence. So this one is, again, it's a bit of a detailed document. Um, that you have to get in addition to your proof of employment. Yeah, and I think what I'd say is we do see quite frequently people will say, like, this is appearing in my account. They are asking me for this information, mm. um, but I'm not sure if my job offer counts. Um, only very specific types of job offers are considered valid. So yeah. if you're getting a request to upload that document and you're not sure like probably it's not valid but definitely uh, you should talk to a professional about that especially if it's crucial for you uh, you know meeting the CRS score requirement for mm -hmm. for the, the invitation round which again less of an issue here but again yeah. that's something where if you're not sure book a consultation uh, and the other document here on this list is the Provincial and Territorial Certificate of Qualification. Um, that's, uh, is that just for federal skilled trades? Yeah, a lot of people think it's, um, you know, if they're certified in their profession, they need it. But this one that they're specifically asking for, it's if you have that trade certificate in Canadian province or Great. territory. Great. So we're not going to go into a ton of detail about that because it's for pretty much a different program um but these last two documents on here we'll spend a little bit more time with the first one is certified translation of documents into english or french deanne what documents need to be translated everything if it's not in english or french then it needs to be translated great <laughs> so for some countries that's going to be you know, it could be a lot of pages, but unfortunately, if you are submitting it and it doesn't, like some countries, documents might have two languages. So it's got English and another language. As long as the English is on there, that's fine. But if there's nothing on there in English or French, then it needs to be translated. Great. Um, yeah. And that's one of the things that they're super stingy about, uh, mm -hmm. where like if you don't do it, they're again, your application is going to get refused. Yeah. Um, and make sure it's a certified translation. Uh, we've got a great guide we just published on the Moving to Canada website about certified translations, like what okay. counts for that. So just make sure, like, you can't just have your friend who speaks English do the translation for you. It has to be certified. Um, and the last thing here is the letter of explanation, uh, which we've talked about before. Um like it's kind of a catch-all document like it can be used um as far as i understand when you don't necessarily have the appropriate documentation or you want to like provide more information like what is the letter of explanation and like in what ways can people use it yeah so it can be anything if i'm going to start with that i guess is if you ever feel that your documents there's something you want to explain further you don't think it's clear you know, anything that you're trying to explain, you're going to put on that letter of explanation. It's your your one chance to explain to the officer anything that you think is unclear, anything that is missing and why it's missing. You know, are you going to upload it later? What is the situation? So this is your opportunity to put all of that information into one place and the officer is going to read through it and use that as they're going through your file. Great. Um, so it's a, it's really useful for explaining your case. And also, if there are any other instances in your application where there's a document that you're supposed to be uploading, but for whatever reason you can't get it, um, you can upload a letter of explanation in place of that document. Um, yeah. Of course, like that doesn't mean they're going to accept it, but like you have to upload something. <laughs> so like if you can't yeah. get a document, like 
upload a letter of explanation and any like l like the example you gave before um deanne of uh not what was it not being able to get the oh they they say you don't need a police certificate for that mm -hmm. country you said like you can also include a screenshot of the ircc website where it doesn't say that along with your short letter explaining i don't need to upload this document because you say i don't need to just screenshot yeah. so that sort of thing um so it, it can be quite a powerful tool remember the people assessing your application are human beings um they have hearts uh so sometimes they do consider what's in your letter um uh, but it's always going to be uh, discretionary um let's uh rattle through uh, oh, so <laughs> what to do if you can't get a document? We were just talking about that a little bit. Uh, failure to submit any document. This is important. Failure to submit any document required by IRCC may result in the rejection of your application. Alternative documents may be accepted, but, and we put this in bold, that's how important it is, final decisions rest at the discretion of the immigration officers. Um, if you can't get a document, you can submit alternative documentation. If that exists, we talked about uh, some of that in reference to the, the work uh, reference letters, um, letters of explanation uh, to explain why you couldn't get the document. That's always a good, uh, a good strategy. Or um, the other option is, you know, if you can't get the documents and you know that it's vital to your, to your application, you can decline your invitation to apply. And how does that work, Deanne? Like, can you then apply again or... Yeah, so if you decline the invitation, then it actually just puts your profile back into the express entry pool, and then you'll be eligible for the next round of invitations. And it doesn't count against you. Um, they know that some people don't get the documents in time, or you know maybe they're not ready to accept the invitation. So if you decline it, it just puts you back into the express entry pool, and it's not going to count as a negative towards you. It's not like they say, okay, well, this guy declined an invitation. We're not even going to pick him next time. No, you just go back in and you'll be considered as you were before. Yeah. So this is this can be a good strategy if you know you're going to get declined anyway and you have a high CRS score. Um, if you're one of those people with one who was, you know, got an ITA in this draw, um, but you have a CRS score at like 300, um, you might want to do your best to submit your application because this may be your only chance. Don't lie on it, but you can submit alternative documentation, letters of explanation. Um, as long as you don't lie, the worst thing that's going to happen is they'll uh, reject your application and you just gotta you know start over again from scratch well but not even from scratch because you'll have your language tests you'll have maybe your education documents like you'll have everything together um in here i also said if you can't get a required document and you're not sure what to do book a consultation with a regulated <laughs> canadian immigration consultant De like dm is so knowledgeable to book your consultation now is i i know i sound like a broken record at this point but like I'm all for doing applications by or like doing immigration by yourself. This is yeah. one of the situations where it really makes sense to get a professional to help you. Um, great. So, okay. We're, we're still going over. Are you good to do a couple more minutes, Deanne? Yeah. Great. Um, most common mistakes. Uh, we just put three things in here. We've touched base on these as we've gone through, but uh, we're going to re-highlight them for you. Police certificates. Um, that's something you see rejections for a lot, Deanne? Yeah, so police clearance is one of the biggest causes of refusal that we see. So it could be that they've uploaded one that's actually technically expired. So that's where we kind of talked about when it had to have been issued and when you left the country. Um, so expiry dates, wrong versions, um, most notably Australia. Like they ask for a standard disclosure, but then if you have the full disclosure, that could be a reason for refusal. Also, uh, with Australia, I'll note, depending on where you lived in Australia, they might also want a driving record uploaded with your police clearance. So some people don't know that. They just get the police clearance, upload that, and then it's refused because they didn't have the driving record. So with the police clearances for any country that you need one, make sure you go through, you know, moving to Canada's guide, go through the, the C, well, IRCC now, their drop-down menu, put in your country, and it's going to tell you specifically which one you need. Make sure you go through it, and that's what you've got. The other reasons with the police clearance, which is kind of petty, but if it's not a colored scan, they can refuse it for submitting a black and white copy. What? What? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's ridiculous, but they actually specifically say it needs to be colored. And then the other thing we've seen that people 
because everyone wants to certify documents, even though it's not requested. I've seen someone make a copy of their police clearance, get it certified, and then upload the certified copy. It was refused because they know that's not a scan of the original. Oh, my God. Okay. Uh, so just take your original, scan it in color exactly as it is, and then that's what you're going to submit. Great. Um, and Kaushik actually has a great question here. Um, what if your police certificate hasn't come before you need to submit your application? I know this used to happen all the time with people mm -hmm. from the U.S. The FBI would take like oh, yeah. <laughs> six months to issue the certificate and people would be like, I can't get this. Uh, what do you do if you can't get it in time? Letter of explanation. You say that, you know, I've applied for it and it's still pending. That's fine. This is one of those documents that they will give you an extension to submit, but you have to upload the letter of explanation to say that you just can't get it in time and that you've applied for it. Okay. And even if you have a receipt, because some countries will issue you the receipt, I usually put the letter of explanation. And I merge the receipt with it because then right. it's just you're showing that you've actually applied and it's pending. Yeah. It's always good to show them that you've been as proactive as you can. Like yeah. you've tried to get it. It just you know the system is against you um the other uh big mistake in here and we touched on this during the topic is work reference letters um so <laughs> this is if you're if you don't have the proper uh duties and responsibilities to justify your noc code if you don't have all of those components that need to be included on the reference letter on letterhead uh, signed by you know the supervisor or the hr department um doesn't include you know your uh, title all of those things if you're missing any of them you can be denied uh, are there any other uh you know uh, common mistakes you see with the work reference letters i mean the most common one is just missing roles and responsibilities. Like that is 90% of what we've seen be the issue with people's employment letters. Um, and then sometimes, I don't know why people do this, they just write their own affidavit confirming what they did. And they don't even try to get a letter from the employer. They specifically say, we will not accept affidavits and self declarations from yourself. So don't go and do that either. <laughs> Great. Seems like it should be obvious, but, um, and the other thing is, uh, the other common mistake we've got in here is, do you meet the requirements at the time you're submitting the application? Uh, we talked about this earlier, guys, you have to continue meeting the minimum eligibility criteria when you submit your application. The easiest example for this is your language test results. Mm -hmm. Let's say they're only valid for two years. Let's say they expire between the time that you receive your invitation to apply and you submit your uh, application uh, you need to, to get new language tests and submit those um, and the other common one with CEC is uh, related to work experience right you need your 12 months of, of full-time uh, skilled work experience obtained in Canada in the 36 months prior to applying so that's up yeah. to the, the moment that you hit submit um, yeah so be aware like if you've stopped working uh, mm -hmm. you might you might actually be losing time the more the more days that uh, that go by is that right yeah exactly yeah so always just make sure that the 12 months or if you needed two years so 24 months to get the points that you had make sure it falls within the 36 months as of the day you're hitting submit not the day you receive the ita great um and again guys if you uh, if you want, uh, you should book a, a PR application review. These are the things that, uh, you know, a consultant's going to catch, uh, because you guys go through like all of the, uh, all of the documents and like check, yeah. like back check all the dates to make sure that all the criteria is met and all, all that fun yeah. stuff. Um, okay. Let's move on to our next slide here. The COVID measures. So I'll give you guys a quick rundown of this. Uh, the disclaimer and the reason we're not going to spend a ton of time on this is that COVID is causing such frequent changes to Canadian immigration um, that the information we're including here uh, may have changed even like next week. Uh, yeah. So we're recording this on February 26, 2021. If you're watching this later, double check to see what's in place. Um, as of right now, applicants are being given 90 days instead of 60 days to submit their applications. Um, mm -hmm. IRCC is stating that applications will not be refused if documents can't be obtained due to COVID-19, um, but they are still <laughs> refusing applications. Um, <laughs> if you can't get a document due to COVID-19, you always have to provide evidence. You have to provide your letter of explanation. You have to explain why you haven't been able to get it. And you should be aware, Deanne, you said they're kind of 
like using this only for certain documents for the most part. Um, yeah, it's it's mostly for passports, police clearances, medicals, and biometrics. If you all of a sudden say, well, I can't get anything on my application because of COVID, that's not going to stand. It's mostly just passports, biometrics, medicals, um, and police clearances that they're being lenient with. Great. Um, that, I think that's important for people to know. It's not a catch-all. You can't just you know, not do things because of COVID, uh, but there are certain uh, certain situations. Um, so for the rest of this, I'm going to refer you guys to our COVID-19 news feed. It's a link to the top mm. of every single web page on the Moving to Canada website uh, for things like biometrics exemptions, new procedures for activating your PR, processing delays. Although if you're applying from in Canada, the processing delays aren't that um that extreme right now if you're outside mm -hmm. Canada expect a major delay yeah. um, and the travel restrictions they are really intense travel restrictions in place right now you got to quarantine in a hotel you have to get COVID tests before and after you arrive if you're coming by air like all of these intense things so check the COVID-19 news feed on our website just to make sure you're up to date on all of that so uh, I think we've we've gotten through everything it only is taking half an hour longer than we thought but before we wrap up, um, Deanne, you have uh, blessed us with your time today and shared uh, all of this amazing immigration knowledge. I do want to give you a chance to talk about, uh, you know, why it makes sense to work with a consultant, especially at this stage of the process. So, uh, you know, <laughs> this is your time to shine, Deanne. You've earned it. Why does it make sense to work with a consultant on a PR application? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, like you've mentioned a few times that the express entry profile, you know, that's a little bit more lenient. You can make changes to it. But now when you're actually submitting the permanent residence application, everything has to be correct that first time. You don't get to update it. You don't get to send new things. They're not going to request it. Everything has to be right up front. So, you know, that's why we really started offering the review is, no, we don't have to do your full application, but the review is is very useful because we can go over these things. And especially if you're using letters of explanation or you don't have 100% the correct documents, we can go through and let you know, is this sufficient enough? Is there something else that we suggest you get? Did you, you know, miss periods of your personal history? So we go through everything. Uh, we check if anything is missing, anything is not overlapping, it doesn't coincide. So it's really just to give you that opportunity to get everything checked before you submit. Because especially with this draw, we really don't know when those low scores are ever going to be picked again. Um, this was, they picked everybody through CEC, which is fantastic. But if your application gets refused now, we don't know when the next opportunity is going to be for you to get permanent residence. So we do also encourage people to do the application themselves. But if you're nervous or you're unsure, I mean, we can answer your questions and we can review everything for you before you submit it. Great. Um, and I've pulled open the uh, PR uh, file review on the Canada Abroad website. I just popped a link down there into the comment section so you can check that out for yourself. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I'm going to second what you said, Deanne. Like this is this is the time. <laughs> this is the time that it makes sense. Um, like out of curiosity, how often do you go through someone's PR application and find that it's like perfect? There's nothing wrong with it. I've never had perfect. I've probably said you know there's only one that I've found where it wouldn't have likely caused a refusal, um, but only once. <laughs> only once. So only once. So guys. <laughs> <laughs> it's worth it. it. It is worth it. Um, and there are a couple other options for you know how a consultant uh, can assist you. Uh, you'll see here just uh, on the bottom half of the slide. Uh, we got the PR application review listed there, but you can also book a consultation. That's just a, a one-time uh, phone call, video call, sometimes in person, but not during the pandemic, um, where you can ask some of the specific questions. So you know maybe you don't have the money for a full PR app review, mm -hmm. but you you have a few questions you want clarity on that's when you would book the consultation um and then Deanne do you guys provide full representation like if somebody just wants you to like help with every aspect of the of the application yeah we I mean we can do full representation um some people want that if they don't have the time or they just don't like doing it yeah. so if anybody you know needs help with that we do do it as well great um but uh yeah for 
uh, for people who are at this stage in the process, the consultation, the PR application review, those are both like uh, really going to help you out here. Uh, and uh, as you've seen throughout this entire uh, live stream, Deanne knows her stuff. Uh, she is going to be able to uh, assist you extensively with this. Like more every like I didn't realize that it was so complicated. I also like used to do these applications. I used to help with them, and I'm like, what this is. This is mine. Yeah. Um, great. So uh, I think that uh, pretty much covers it for today. I know we've had a ton of questions coming through. We haven't been able to answer everybody's questions. Um, as you can see, like uh, answers are often like hyper specific based on your own personal circumstances. So I apologize mm -hmm. if I couldn't uh, help you out today. Uh, Mary say, Mary just commented, it was extremely helpful. Thanks very much for both of you for holding this today. Uh, thank okay. you guys for attending. Uh, probably uh, we'll be doing more of these uh, over the period of time before this like 27,000 cohort is finished applying. So that's in May. Um, so we we'll probably be back. So you can always check our, our feed for more of the resources to help you guys out. And thank you, Deanne. It's been an absolute pleasure. You are brilliant. You really know your stuff. I'm so thankful that you uh, joined us for the live stream today. Yeah, no, thanks. And hopefully, you know, it helped a lot of people out there. Great. Uh, so we will see you guys next time. Uh, thanks again and stay safe out there. Best of luck on your PR applications.